This program contains four history lesson starters, each exploring a different aspect of immigration to Britain since 1945. You can download supporting notes for each clip from the Teachers TV website. I was born on the north coast of Jamaica, and I came here when I was 24 years old. We had stories about lots of things, including there's nobody jobless in England, and the jobs were well paid. My thoughts and all the things I had in me before I step off that boat had vanished in thin air. You couldn't walk downtown and see a black person on the front of any shop, whether it was supermarket or whether it was anything. You wouldn't see them in the bank. They would have been in the back doing something. And if it was a big store, you wouldn't see them up front. No, they were color bar in every field. The color bar itself is, if I wanted a job from a white you, you'd say, no, I can't give you because you're black. Or you might not say that. You might just say, no, I don't want you. But back in 1963, what made the headline was when a young chap named Guy Bailey saw in the Evening Post that they need bus conductors. He tried to apply on the phone for an interview, and they said yes. And when he went, they said, it's a white chap talk to us. And he said, no, it's me because I speak English. And they refused even the interview. A lot of people was really angry about it. There was no such thing as a law. I think that never came until about nearly 70. Discrimination was not on the book at all. You could say, do anything. Whilst we can obtain white labor in this city, we intend to go on engaging white labor rather than colored labor. we decided to boycott the buses, which we did for six weeks. During the crisis, one of the bus drivers said to me, along with the bus conductor, if one of you come on here, my wife would never conduct on this bus. And I said to him, I gotta tell you something. If you want her to leave, tell her to leave now because we are going to come on those buses and we are going to conduct and in due time, we are going to drive it. Paul Stevenson was our spokesperson, and what the bus committee said to him was, they will allow a limited amount, but the limited amount did not have any number. It could be one, and it could be two. But they will allow them to be interviewed. They did interview an Indian bloke, and he was the first on the bus. We felt like we were winning. Not on a grand scale, but it's better to have one foot on the ladder than have no foot on the ladder. And we said we'll take it from here. My father started the shop here in 1978 and he saw a niche in the market that not many businesses were doing ethnic foods and he started more sort of as a sweet shop but today we're one of the most specialist shops here in Bristol. The variety of food we do caters for all sorts of people from all over the world. And the recent immigrants have been the Kurdish from Iraq and they've been the Kosovans, they've been the Polish. People try different kinds of food but at the end of the day you belong somewhere for a long time and you came in here, you still want that product. So we've got to cater for it. And our range seems to be increasing all the time. I think we do nearly over 30 different rice, including black rice, which is from Canada. It's actually grass seeds that makes the rice very nutty. The Pakistani tends to be very earthly rice. Indian rice tends to be cleaner, uh, different taste. Chiku comes from West Indies and from Africa. It's very much like fresh dates with a very large black stone inside. Pomegranates, they come from Jordan, India, Pakistan. You need to literally uh, take out all the juicy seeds uh, with your fingers. We're in the eastern part of Bristol, uh, which is an inner city area. Um, you get a lot of uh, ethnic people around here. 
Looking at the businesses, a lot of food shops have come in. You've got quite a few different pizza and fast food places that also do ethnic. You know, you get like chicken tikka pizza. So the variety is a bit bigger now. You've seen Somali shops, and it's flourishing now. Recently, there's quite a few sari shops that have opened up. So these shops, you know, they've sprung up in Stapleton Road, and uh, they're, they're doing good business. Um, you know, with Bollywood films getting more and more popular, the younger generation watches it, and hence then they want to dress up like that. Stapleton Road now, it's changed. Here you've got Somalis, you've got Kosovans, you've got people from India, you've got uh, Pakistanis, you've also got Africans. Caribbean people, so the variety is just endless, really. The, the, the face of the city is changing gradually. Um, for those who, are, who have been here about a decade or two decades, there have been a lot of transformation. It used to be a net club. It wasn't like this before. <laughs> They used to have their bars, the stage where they have their dancing, all the taps for the for this for serving their drink and all those things. So, so when we came in, there, there has to be a transformation. We, we put into our own tastes. We changed the color. It used to be painted black. They used to have some some disco lights, which are not part of our culture. So we remove it. We have over four thousand parishes in Nigeria alone, and. Uh, large congregation in Nigeria. And then from there, the church started spreading to other parts of the world. These days, people in black African countries come into the country with Christian background, and all this has actually contributed to the increase in the population of the people who are Christian in the country. In recent time, uh, people from other parts of the world are coming to the country. People are migrating to, this, to the country. And as they are migrating, they migrated with their, with their religion. all the founder of this mosque, they were from Pakistan. Most of uh, they came in the early 60s into Bristol. Before this mosque, they were actually putting people's houses. In 1967, this church came up for sale, and then when the local Muslim, they get together, and they raise the money, and they bought this uh, building. They start doing the renovation little by little, and actually they took them about seven, eight years or to build, and that's, that's their work, that's, that's, that's their hard work. When you walk into the mosque, you have to take your shoes off because every, all the places are carpeted. In the mosque, you're not allowed to have any pictures. Uh, the only thing you will find in the mosque actually, is the verses for the Quran. You have to be clean okay, before you enter the mosque and uh, you have to be in a state of voodoo. Voodoo is a cleansiness. What you have to do is clean your hand three times, wash your uh, goggle three times, wash your nose three times, wash your face three times, the elbow three times, both of them and then wash your feet, actually it was three times. Uh, you need to do that before you say any prayer. Majority of the Hindu people came from Uganda in 1972. Once they sort out their food and accommodation, the second, third thing they will think about, place of worship. This temple has been here since 1982. It was closed down Methodist Church, and the Hindu people found these premises, and that's how they started the temple. Because we are in small community here in Bristol, uh, we don't have lots of spare money to build a huge, massive temple, but still we got a small sample, so at least we can say that, oh, the Hindu temples should look like this. There should be columns, arches, domes, and top of the dome there will be a flag. Om is our main holy symbol. Om represents the whole Hinduism itself. If you look around, you'll see the picture of Jesus Christ here in the Hindu temple. Uh, well, big surprise. <laughs> so that means what our religion teach us. We people are worshipping that one God using the different, different names. Before it was house of Jesus Christ. Now it's house of Lord Krishna.
I was born in Turkey, in the city of Denizli, which is the southwest of Turkey. I left there when I was five. We moved to England. When I first arrived, it was a new world for me. Everything just seems different, you know, the multicultural people, you know, different race, the area, you know, the buildings, plus getting used to the language. It, it was just, you know, it was hard, but finally managed it. <laughs> We got raided by the police. It was 6 a.m. in the morning. I, I heard this sudden bang. It was, it was a sudden, you know, thump on the door. I woke up, I was in shock, you know. I told my mother, I think we're getting robbed, we should call the police. As soon as I went to the door, I noticed it was the police. I didn't know what to believe in because the people who were supposed to help us are the people, you know, who were coming to get us. My mother said to me, the police weren't getting in, so we should try to get out. We went through the back door to the garden. We jumped over to our outhouse. We lay flat there because at that moment we, we heard um, a loud thump. We noticed it was the, you know, the police broken in. We lay there, it, w it was really cold. It was, it was raining. My baby brother, he was only one. You know, he was on his pyjamas. It was, you know, it was freezing temperature. After some time, there wasn't any more noise. So my mother said, you know, to peek if they're still there. So I, I raised my head just to see. I noticed this woman, she was searching around and then she quickly turned into my eyes. At that moment, I thought, you know, they caught us, it's all over, it's game over. I put my head down. I just waited because I thought it was going to be over. My heart was beating so fast. We waited, we waited, but nothing happened. So I told my mum, we need to get down, we need to get out. We got down to the neighbour's garden. I noticed there was a Somalian girl there. She was in the kitchen. I knocked on the door. Well, you know, she, she was shocked to see us, you know. She ran to her parents. She came back with her mother and her aunt. We told them, you know, the story, if they could help us. Two minutes later, one of the ladies came back with one jacket and one slippers. We gave the jacket to my little baby brother and the slippers to my mother. After that, we jumped onto the last garden. We knocked on the window, you know, to, to seek for help. There was a white English woman. I told her if, if she could open the back door so we could get out. Without blinking, she went and opened the door. We got out. I don't think I'll ever forget that.